We are not only discussing the history of Lisette Quitte La Plaine, but also it's the implications of that history, right? The song that was popular among, um, within a slave-holding society, written um, initially by a French colonizer, right, from the island, but popular within a slaveholding society, but that gains different meanings as it travels through time. And, um, Maria, welcome. And can you tell us a little bit about the inherent difficulty of studying music from this time period? Thank you for this question. Um, I think that when we are considering um, performances of European music in the colonial Caribbean in the 18th century, there's certain things we really need to keep in mind that perhaps we don't or we haven't been trained to think about when we're thinking about European music taking place in Europe during that same century. Um, and on top of that, we can maybe get to this later, there are various archival issues um, with thinking about music from this period and this particular place. So first of all, it sounds obvious, but this music was taking place in the context of slavery. As you just said, um, Europe created massive wealth in the 18th century. You alluded to the wealth that came out of Saint-Domingue, mostly through sugar and coffee crops that were also so um, most common in the British colonial Caribbean. Um, and thus it relied on the labor of enslaved Africans and their descendants and their coerced labor. Um, it really did curtail people's lifespans. So brutal was the crop. And so this is all happening at the same time, as you said, that are these operas happening. So to always bear that in mind. Um, another thing I think to think about is demographics. White people were the minority the demographic minority in Caribbean colonies, often quite significantly. And you better believe that people did not forget about that. So even when we examine an object, you know, a printed newspaper advertising a performance or a illustration of an opera house, it may look superficially similar uh, to something in London or in Paris, but below it is all sorts of anxiety about how do you manage a majority African and African descended population when you are the minority. And I think that leads to another question, which is who was listening to this music? The sources don't always tell us that, but people lived in close quarters. Of course, there was a segregation to an extent, but there's lots of accounts um, of boys in the fields whistling Handel with accuracy or the circulation of tunes beyond where they were intended or where listening was even anticipated. Uh, so those are some things to bear in mind as we think about music from this period. So excellent. And this is what excites me about Lisette Quitte La Plaine because when I first encountered this song, um, I had to ask myself, who is this song for in its first iteration, knowing that it was really popular within the elite, among the elite of the society. Henry, can you tell us a little bit about where a song like Lisette Quitte La Plaine would have been heard? Paint the scene for us. Sure, there were really no shortage of opportunities for performance of a song like Lisette in the colony. Uh, you know, among the, the upper classes, you have theaters, you have public and private salons. Of course, you have the home, you also have pubs, uh, you have concert societies. And there's also a lot of evidence that attests to a circulation of songs uh, among the enslaved Africans and the colonists. So you, you can expect the song to also have been sung uh, on plantations as well. And Henry, can you tell us a little bit about concert life? in Saint-Domingue about opera and orchestra work, things like that, chamber music. Well, Saint-Domingue, as you said, was the richest colony in the French empire. So they were really importing all of the you know, musical and artistic luxury straight from Paris. Uh, some scholars have estimated there was more opera per capita in, in Saint-Domingue than in Paris. And indeed, there really was a lot of um, a lot of musical venues. There were theaters, there were opera houses, again, uh, concert societies, cathedrals, um, pubs, cafes, really you name it. If it existed in France, they probably had it in Saint-Domingue as well. You know, music scholarship sort of dropped a thread when we get to the Haitian Revolution. And so for a long time, it seems like this classical music tradition in Haiti almost comes out of nowhere. But of course, as I've been studying 
Haitians start performing French music immediately after the Haitian Revolution. I mean, literal days after the Haitian Revolution is concluded and throughout the Haitian Revolution as well. Um, I call this music sort of their, their musical spoil of war. Uh, it was French and now it was theirs and, and, and they refashioned this music with great creativity. i 